momentum. Uh, I get that one All right. Just not good with the ladies, like you said. Right? All right. Try this one. Hi, I'm Paul. You have beautiful eyes. Hi, I'm Paul, and you have beautiful eyes. I'd love to take you out sometime. I'd love to take you out sometime. So how much? So how much? With a great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down. Make it a Bud Light. All right, so. Impact is something that we discussed quite a bit within the context of acceleration, right? So acceleration is how fast the velocity changes in time, how fast you speed up, how fast you slow down, how fast you change direction. So speeding up, slowing down, and changing direction is referred to as acceleration. All right, the generalized formula that we're using for acceleration is the average acceleration formula. So the acceleration, the velocity goes from this value to the next value within this time period. So that's going to give you the average acceleration. All right, so there's an underlying assumption here. The underlying assumption is that the acceleration is changing in time as well, which means that you end up getting jerk. If there's jerk, use the average acceleration form. All right, if there's jerk, which means that if the acceleration is changing within a certain time period, which value of the acceleration do you use? Do you use the maximum one? Do you use the minimum one? Or do you pick something in the middle just for the hell of it? All right, how do you make a decision? The maximum one is not going to tell you anything. Minimum one is not going to tell you anything because it's going to be zero. And do you just eyeball it and say, okay, I'm just going to pick a value on the, I don't know, like a hundredth of a second into this. What do you do? Randomize it? How do you figure that out? So if there's change in acceleration, obviously the best thing to do is to find the average acceleration. And guess what? This is the formula that gives you that. All right. So if there's change in acceleration, you get the average acceleration. And that's what we did. That's what we've been doing ever, ever since week number one or week number two. Uh, we've been just analyzing acceleration. And we've been analyzing impact and we've been always looking at the average acceleration for that reason. And the important thing regarding the average acceleration is we know what's survivable and what's not. We got numbers in terms of what's survival in terms of the average acceleration. You know, you can survive between 72 Gs up to a few minutes, 20 to 25, up to a few seconds. And you should be able to survive between 100 to 140 Gs for a fraction of a second. All right, so these are empirical numbers that we got. And these numbers are only for average acceleration, not instantaneous acceleration, not uniform acceleration, average acceleration, meaning that these numbers are the ones which are measured in the chaos of impact, during the chaos of impact. So it's 70 to 12, up to a few minutes, 20 to 25, up to a few seconds, 100 to 120 for a fraction of a second under extreme, extreme constraints. And these are the numbers that we've been using ever since week number two in order to analyze impact. All right. so. We are building onto the concept of average acceleration because there's more within the context that within the context of impact that we can study and analyze. All right, so acceleration becomes survivable. Every time I'm talking about surviving impact, I'm, I'm talking about surviving acceleration. Acceleration is what kills, what breaks your bones, what tears your muscles, what maims it. All right, so the whole idea of surviving impact is surviving acceleration. All right, so change of velocity is going to be the same. When you take a punch to the face, for example, your face is always going to go from zero to something else. The example that I gave you was getting hit by Tyson. All right, he can hit you with a bare hand. Your face is st still going to go from zero to say about 100 miles per hour with a single punch. If he's wearing gloves, it's going to increase the impact time. It's going to reduce the acceleration. And all of a sudden, you got a story to tell. If he's not wearing gloves, who knows what happened? All right, your change in velocity is still the same. Single punch, whether he's wearing gloves or not, your face is still going to be traveling at 100 miles per hour. The only thing the gloves end up doing is it introduces an impact time. All right, so the impact time goes up, the acceleration goes down, and it becomes more survivable. All right, so this is this is the topic that we're going to be building upon. All right, so this is the acceleration. Acceleration is how fast the velocity changes in time. All right, and this thing is accelerating in the forward direction within this time period. So the next question is, what causes it? Newton's second law says external force. External force is what causes acceleration. All right, so in the absence of an external force, no change in velocity, no acceleration. In the presence of an external force, there's gonna be acceleration. All right, and we write out the acceleration in terms of how fast the velocity changes in time. We'll move the time expression to the left. The only thing we will have on the right-hand side is mass changing its velocity. So if there is a time and the duration of time, if this force is present for this duration, what it's gonna do is it's gonna change the velocity of this mass so the velocity of this mass is going to go from an initial to a final value. And instead of seeing it this way, we'll come up with an expression 
a combination of mass and velocity, and we will call that momentum. So momentum is the same as motion, as P is momentum. Newton used to refer to this as motion. So when there's force present for a certain period of time, what the force does, it changes momentum. All right, so the force and its duration is known as impulse. Uh, this is known as the impulse momentum theorem. So impulse is a combination of force and the duration of that force. And what happens during impulse is the momentum changes in time. That's it. All right, so that's the impulse momentum theorem. One of the concepts that you will be testing on. All right, because we have, we are using average acceleration. This implies that there is a variable acceleration, which implies that the force is gonna be a variable force, which implies that we have to use the average force itself. All right, so F is gonna become the average force, and this happens to be the duration of that force. So the average force is present for this duration, and what's happening because of the average force is the momentum is changing, motion is changing. All right, so this is a re-expression of Newton's second law, the force law, in essence. So there's gonna be a change in momentum because of the presence of an external force acting on the system. Conceptually, college physics or university physics, it makes no difference. I require the same level of understanding. The computer displays the results. First, the novice, and then Yang Ming's. The difference is the enormous speed of his hand compressed into a short space of time. All right, so there are two things to emphasize here. Number one, the concept of power. So the power is how fast the work is done, how fast the energy is transferred, and speed with which the force is transferred. All right, so in terms of power, this guy happens to be more powerful than his counterpart who can only break one plate at a time. I'm just gonna say, All right? This person is able to break a lot more. I'll do with slabs that he, he's sitting. It's not necessarily, it doesn't need to be stronger than a guy who can only break one at a time. The only thing he has to do is he has to move his hand faster. All right, so it, it's, if he's just as strong as the next guy is, and then you can measure the strength in terms of the, the you know, bench pressing. If this guy can bench press 250, the other guy can also bench press 250. If that's the maximum that they're gonna be able to bench press, which means that they would have the same strength. Except when the other guy hits it, all of a sudden, boom, you notice that the, the force is dispersed onto a much larger time period. And when this guy does that, then boom, notice that the same amount of force is delivered much faster because his hand is moving much faster in essence. So he's able to take the same amount of force delivered much faster, meaning that He's actually more powerful. He's not necessarily stronger. Okay. So the question is, what makes him more powerful? If it's not the strength, is it because he's able to move his hand much faster? God damn it. Well, you can, you can also move your hand just as fast. It's not a big deal. We said the difference between this guy and analysis, is this guy had done it like a billion times. All right. So a lot of it is confidence. He's not going to chicken out in the last second. All right. This guy is, he knows that he's going to hit it. He knows that he's going to be able to break it because he's done it a million times before. So that's the difference. One of the things that we're gonna focus on is which one actually hurts more, all right? Just breaking through the material or just chickening out, chickening out and then just stopping in the middle of it, all right? I mean, you hit it hard enough, so you're breaking a couple of the wooden slabs, but you're not, you're not breaking all of them, all right? So which one is gonna hurt more is the one that we will focus on. Number one is the concept of power, uh, how fast the work is done, how fast the energy is transferred, in this case, how fast the kinetic energy is transferred within a certain time period. All right, so the work is a combination of force and displacement. So displacement divided by time is gonna be velocity. So this is speed at which this force is being delivered that we're looking at. So what happened? So you may have two people. It's got, it happens to be equally as strong and the one who's moving his hand faster is gonna be more powerful in this case. All right, so that's the concept of power. So in terms of impulse, what's happening? Remember impulse is stuff that's, it's changing momentum in essence. All right, impulse is changing momentum. And in this case, the change of momentum of the hand that you're looking at, all right? So the hand is gonna go from a certain speed to a certain other speed that you're looking at. And so it's, it's how, how much the momentum changes, changing momentum is gonna be impossible. So that's gonna depend on the impact time and it's gonna depend on 
the impact impact force, right? It's a combination of the impact force and the impact time that you're looking at. All right, so let's just analyze that. So whatever you're breaking at, change of momentum is going to be smaller. All right, the reason is because your hand is not going to go from say 50 miles per hour to zero. If you're breaking through the target, guys, your hand is slows down, but it keeps on moving. All right. So your hand is going to go from 50 miles per hour, I don't know, maybe 20 miles per hour, as you're going through these wooden slabs. All right, so whenever you're breaking through the material, the change in momentum is going to be smaller, which means that your impulse is going to be smaller. All right, so the combination of the amount of force that you're applying and the impact on is going to be much, much, much smaller under the circumstances. When you're not breaking it, <laughs> your hand goes from 50 miles per hour to zero. All right, so impulse is going to be much larger, which means that the change in momentum is going to be much larger. All right, so here your impulse is going to be much larger. Um, meaning here your impulse is much smaller, which means the change in momentum is going to be much smaller. And what's happening is the duration is going to be much smaller. In this case, the force is going to be much larger in this sense. But in essence, the amount of force you're not, these two are not applying the same amount of force in essence either. Right? That's the meaning of it. So impact time is going to be smaller. The force is going to be larger as well. But if you're applying the same amount of force, and let's pretend that both of them are applying the same amount of force somehow. All right, so change of momentum is smaller because your hand is going to go from, I don't know, 50 miles per hour to like 20 miles per hour. It's, it keeps on moving. You're, you're dealing with the same amount of force, but within a much shorter time period. Here, uh, your hand goes from 50 to zero. So change of momentum is much larger, assuming that, that you're applying the same amount of force, but your impact time is much larger, which means that you're not moving your hand at the same speed. All right, so um, when you break it, impulse is actually smaller, which means that change in momentum is smaller when you don't break it, when you don't succeed in breaking it, change in momentum is much larger. The impact time is also larger, but you're delivering the same amount of work, which means that this is gonna hurt a lot more than this one does. Okay, so that's the difference between an expert and a novice. The expert knows, hey, if I break it, it's not gonna hurt as much. The novice does not know that. The novice goes, oh, I'm just as strong, but I don't wanna hurt myself because I've never done this before. And if he's moving his hand at the same speed initially, and then when he starts to break things, he kind of chickens out a little bit, not realizing that he's actually hurting himself more. All right, so conservation of momentum, head on collision between two masses, action and reaction forces will be the same. So for every single action force, there's gonna be equal and opposite reaction force. We've seen examples of this, like a car, an SUV, head on collision between a car and an SUV. Which one experiences a larger impact force? The answer to that question is the same, obviously. Uh, person getting hit by a train, which one experiences a larger impact force? It's the same. Whatever the force acting on the person, the same force is going to act on the train. Right? All right, so for analysis purposes, we'll extend this Newton's third law into the impulse momentum theorem. All right, so the impulse momentum theorem is going to be applied to this. Okay, so we've got two masses, and we're going to be looking at the impulses on both masses. All right, so here's the first mass. The impulse transfer to the first mass is related to the amount of force that the first mass is going to experience within this impact arm. So what's going to happen is this momentum is going to change. The impulse transfer to the second mass is, once again, the same force is acting on the second mass within the same duration. So what's happening is its momentum is going to change. So now we're going to look at the total impulse of the system. And then in this case, the system is known as an isolated system because we're only going to be focusing on the masses, interacting masses in this case. So the total impulse of the system is the uh, summation of all the impulses, transfer to all the masses that we're looking at. All right, so the impulse of the transfer to the first mass, impulse transfer to the second mass, they will have a common impact time. So we'll just factor that out. And so during impulse, the momentum of the first mass is gonna change. And also the momentum of the second mass is gonna change. All right, so this becomes our final expression. All right, so impulse is a combination of the, in this case, it's gonna be a combination of the net force and the duration of that net force. So we'll have to take a look at the net force in this case. So which means that you have to sum up all the forces within the system. All right, so in this case, the net force is gonna be the combination, it's gonna be a summation of action and reaction forces. For every single action force, there's gonna be an equal and opposite reaction force. So which means that the action and reaction forces will add up to zero. So the net force of an isolated system will always be zero because the net force will always be due to the action and reaction forces. And, or we will say the net force was always gonna be due to the internal forces. All right, so action and reaction forces will become the internal forces of the system. So what that means, the total impulse of any isolated system will be zero, which means that the net change of momentum of an isolated system is gonna be zero. So isolated systems will always conserve momentum. So whatever the change of momentum of the first mass is, 
again, be equal to the change in momentum of the second mass. That's what it means. All right, so we'll just get rid of the parentheses. We'll take a look at the initial, and we'll gather the initial momentum terms on the right-hand side, and final momentum terms on the left-hand side. So here's the final momentum of the system before, this is the final momentum after collision. This is the initial momentum before collision. So this is the final total momentum. This is the initial total momentum of the system. All right, so which means that the total momentum of the system is gonna remain constant. This is known as the conservation of momentum principle. So every single collision is gonna conserve momentum because in every single collision among the system of interacting masses, the action and reaction forces will be the internal forces. So every single collision conserves momentum. So the summary statement is, if the momentum is conserved, which means that the momentum is going to be constant. So total momentum before and back will be the same as the total momentum after. And then you get the impact in the middle. All right, so before, after, total momentum before is the same as total momentum after. So here's the total momentum after, here's the total momentum before. So the net momentum of the system will remain constant. All right, so impulse is a combination of force and its duration. And impulse is the same as change of momentum. All right, so the change of momentum is caused by the presence of a force within a certain time period, right? So that's what it means. Momentum is mass giving, mass moving at a given velocity. So the speed is going to matter, the direction is going to matter. So it's a vector. The reason why we use the average force in impulse calculations is because in a sort of collision, implies that the acceleration is changing in time. If the acceleration is changing in time, which means that the force is changing in time. Uh, so which means that the force is going to change between a minimum and a maximum value. So it makes sense to use the average force under the circumstances within that time period. So what happens to momentum during impulse? Obviously, momentum changes. That's the meaning of impulse. So impulse means change in momentum, which means that the velocity is changing. So what happens to force if the duration of impulse is short? Impulse is a combination of force and its duration. So if you reduce the duration, increases the force. All right. So they're inversely related. The uh, impact time goes down, the impact force goes up. It's the same as impact. Impact time goes down, the acceleration goes up. All right, it's exactly the same thing. So instead of saying, oh, well, you know, during impact, you try to increase the impact time as much as possible in order to reduce the acceleration. Because acceleration is what kills you, what maims you, what breaks your bones. It's the same as saying, okay, so you try to increase the impact time in order to reduce the impact force. Because impact force is what causes the damage. All right, so you reduce impact time, if you reduce the impact time, the impact force is going to go up. If you increase the impact time, the impact force is going to go down. All right, so the impulse is getting constant because impulse just means, hey, it's changing momentum in this case. So when you get punched by Tyson, your face is still going to go from zero to 100 miles per hour. If he's not wearing gloves, the impact force is going to be real large. If he's wearing gloves, the impact force is going to be relatively small, enough to be survivable, one hole. All right, so the unit for momentum is going to be kilograms meters per second. Impulse is going to be Newton's second, uh, because impulse is changing momentum. These units can be used interchangeably. All right, so what happens to the object's momentum if there's enough force acting on it? So it's a single mass. If there's enough force acting on an object for this duration, it's going to change its momentum. So force is going to cause the momentum to change. It's going to cause object to speed up, slow down, or change direction. So the velocity is going to change, which means that the object is going to accelerate. So impulse momentum theorem is a re-expression of Newton's second law. So what happens to the momentum of an object in the absence of an external force, no external force, means there's no change in momentum. So which means that the momentum is gonna remain constant. So the initial and the final momentum of that particular mass is gonna remain the same. Now we're moving on to the isolated system. So the system or isolated system refers to the interacting masses, all right? Interacting masses. In this case, in this chapter, the masses are interacting through collisions. All right, so you've got a head-on collision between a big mass and a small mass. It's like a person getting hit by a train. It's the same. All right, so this is your isolated system. So the isolated system only concerns itself with the interacting masses. It does not concern itself with anything outside of the system. All right, so if it's a three-car collision, you have three cars in your isolated system. If you got 10 people getting hit by a bus, your isolated system is bus and 10 people are getting hit. Not the alumni guy who's taking the, taking the pictures of it or video. All right, that's not an isolated, that guy's not part of the isolated system. So there would be no external force acting on an isolated system. External forces between colliding objects will become action and reaction forces, and they will become internal forces, and action and reaction forces will add up to zero. So net external force of an isolated system is always gonna be zero, all right? 
And what happens to the total momentum between two colliding objects in an isolated system? Well, the total momentum between two colliding objects is, is within an isolated system is going to remain constant because there's no external force acting on an isolated system. All right, the only forces are internal forces. The internal forces add up to zero, so there's no net external force acting on the isolated system. So as a result, the momentum remains constant. The net momentum of a system is going to remain constant. So what is the conservation of momentum? It's the constancy of momentum. What conserves momentum? Absence of an external force on an isolated system. We've got the elastic collision and we've got the inelastic collision. All collisions will conserve momentum if the collision is elastic. Kinetic energy is also conserved. If it's inelastic, kinetic energy is not conserved. Uh, so we'll deal with those collisions later. Examples of conservation of momentum. Recoiling rival is an example of it. All right, so what causes rival to recoil? There are two explanations for it. The explanation that I will be interested in on this task is the second one, the one which is related to the conservation of momentum. The first explanation is the one that we dealt with before, which is the Newton's third law, which means for every single action force, there's going to be an equal and opposite reaction force. So that's the one that we dealt with. So whatever the force acting on the bullet is, the same force is going to act on the rifle. That's the meaning of it. All right, so bullet is not as massive. So the acceleration of the bullet is going to be noticeably high. All right, so as the bullet is exiting the barrel, the bullet is going to be accelerating inside the barrel at a constant rate. So because there's a force acting on the bullet, so bullet is going to speed up. Acceleration of the bullet is going to be fairly light because it's not as massive. Hence the reason why the bullet upon exiting is going to be moving at a fairly high speed. Same force is going to act on the rifle. The rifle is extremely massive. So which means that the acceleration of the rifle is going to be a relatively small. So at the end of that acceleration, the rifle is not going to be moving as fast. Uh, so this is known as the action and reaction run. So you can explain why the bullet is moving fast. And why the rifle is not moving as fast, you can explain why the rifle is kicking back because it's experiencing the reaction force. Uh, so you can explain the recoiling of a rifle using the Newton's third law. All right, on this task though, you have to explain it using the conservation of momentum. So your isolated system is composed of a rifle and a bullet. Before you pull the trigger, all right, so bullets is not moving, rifle is not moving, so the total momentum of the system is zero. Right after you pull the trigger, the bullet is moving, so is the rifle. Total momentum of the system is still zero, right? So whatever the change in momentum of the bullet is, it's gonna be exactly the same as the change in momentum of the rifle, all right? So whatever the change in momentum that the bullet undergoes, the rifle is gonna undergo the same change in momentum in essence. So the difference is though, the bullet is not as massive, so change in momentum is gonna be the same. So the momentum is the same, both of them will have the same momentum. Smaller mass is gonna have a much larger speed, and the bigger mass is gonna have a much smaller speed. All right, so that's it. All right, as a result, the rifle is not moving as fast. So every single collision is gonna conserve momentum. If kinetic energy is also conserved, this is known as elastic collision. If the kinetic energy is not conserved, it's known as inelastic collision. All right, so notice that quite a bit of loss of speed when the collisions are inelastic. Real life collisions, 100% of the time will be inelastic. Real life collisions are inelastic. In theoretical computations, in modern, in modern physics, we sometimes use elastic collisions. Okay, elastic collisions are good for approximations. Usually, real life collisions are inelastic. In any collision, there's in any collision, there's usually a deformation. There's going to be heat, so kinetic energy gets converted into deformation if a person is getting hit by a car. Um, billiard balls colliding, you will hear sound, and some of that kinetic energy is going to get converted into heat. All right, so kinetic energy is going to appear in different forms of energy in real life. So real life collisions are in elastic collision. All right, so ballistic pendulum. All right, so this was the lab that we did last night and we'll repeat the same lab today. All right, so depending upon your situation, I'm kind of mix it up a little bit. All right, so expect a ballistic pendulum problem if you're a university physics student. All right, if you're a university physics student, this is a must, just expect it. This is a standard problem. It's gonna be this week's lab. It is this week's lab know how to do this stuff and know how to do it inside out. This is a super, super cute problem. Got a lot of physics in it. All right, so this is one of the problems that you will have to focus on. All right, so the purpose of the ballistic pendulum problem is to figure out the muzzle speed of a uh, handgun or rifle or whatnot. All right, so when you're talking about muzzle speed, you're talking about the speed at which the uh, bullet exits the muzzle of a gun. That's what you're looking at. So uh, the way to do it is you just shoot a bullet into a block. 
right? And this block is part of a pendulum. And so, and then the pendulum is just gonna rise up to a certain height. And the only thing you get to measure is little the mass of the block, the mass of the block, and then this height. And from that information alone, you can get a really good estimate in terms of how fast this bullet is traveling. All right, so the ballistic pendulum pump is a standard pump. So this is the pump that you will get to practice and practice and practice and practice. When you're practicing a pump like this, all right. Um, also practice showing work and, and showing work meaning that explain, explain it when you're actually doing it. All right. And that's exactly what I'm doing, the stuff that I'm doing. When my lips are moving, guys, I'm providing tons of explanation. All right, that's the sort of stuff I would expect on the test. Okay, I cannot see your lips, obviously, when I'm looking at your solution, which means that feel free to explain stuff. All right, you got 45 minutes, just feel free to explain. It. Feel free in terms of where you're getting these formulas from. When you pick a formula, you have to justify it. These are not math problems. You're not taking a math course. You're using mathematics to solve a physics problem. So which means that you have to explain and justify every single formula. You have to defend it, in essence. All right, because the quality of your solution depends on the quality of the assumptions that you're making. If you're not making quality assumptions, obviously your solution is not going to work. And I don't usually look at the numbers. I just want to make, I just check the, really just glance at the number, you should check to see if the number makes sense. And obviously it needs to be expressed in terms of the British unit system by the time you're done with that. So I have an idea if you're way off or if you actually know how to write and interpret numbers. Usually I glance at it, and what takes you 45 minutes to write down? It takes me about 15 to 30 seconds to wait normally, all right? I just want to say, I check to see where the work is. I check to see where your, what your assumptions are. Check to see if you were able to justify. Check to see if it's muscle memory. I check to see if it's a real physics problem. I mean, I look at your solution. By looking at the way you approach your problem, I have a really good idea how well you actually understand this stuff. And half of you guys are still struggling. You're, you're just attempting to solve a problem as if it is a math problem. The explanations are missing. This, these are not math problems. These are physics problems. You have to explain and justify. Having said that, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And the reason why these problems are going to be test problems, because they will require a lot of explanations, a lot of justifi justifications. And there's absolutely no way to fake this sort of stuff. Here's your first mass, here's your second mass. The bolt is being shot into your block. That's it. And then the combination is just going to rise up. All right, so, so you're shooting a bullet into your pendulum, ballistic pendulum. All right, so mass of the bullet, the mass of the block, it's a combined mass, it's just going to rise up. The thing that we're looking for is the muzzle velocity, the initial speed of the bullet, the bullet as it exits the gun. Block is not moving initially, so it's gonna be zero. So this is the momentum of the bullet, this is the momentum of the block. And the combination is just gonna rise up in that direction. All right, so right after impact, it's gonna have an initial speed. This will be the initial speed of the block. I'm gonna change the notation on that one a little bit. All right, um, initially the block is not moving, but right after impact, it's gonna have this, it's gonna have this speed as it's rising up. All right, so the mass of the bullet is given. You want to know the initial speed of the bullet. Mass of the block is given. Initially, the block is not moving. And the block, the pendulum is just going to rise up. Uh, so block and the bullet combination is just going to rise up through a height of the letter Y. The reason why we will use that letter is because it's a two-dimensional motion and the motion along the vertical direction is taken to be along the Y direction. All right, so that's the reason why instead of using H, I'm using the letter Y, it's extended rotation. All right, so any collision is gonna conserve momentum. And the reason why I'm gonna start off with the conservation of momentum is because what I'm looking for is the initial speed and the initial speed is gonna be contained within this formula. That's always the reason why. Every time I pick a formula, I just say, I always explain. If my lips are always moving when I'm actually solving a problem, guys. I always explain, hey, here's the reason why I'm picking this formula. This, um, the reason why I'm picking this formula is because it's got what I'm looking for in it. It's got the initial speed. And also I know that this is a collision. All right, I, I know that the momentum is conserved, which means that the momentum related to speed because you got a velocity in it. I know it's got my initial speed in it. That's the one I'm gonna start off with, all right? I got like 50, 100 formulas on the formula sheet. Which one do you use? All right, the one that I'm gonna use is gonna be related to momentum, the conservation of momentum, obviously. So momentum is conserved during impact. And I'm thinking, okay, here's what I'm looking for. This is right here. So I'm, the rest of what I'm gonna do is just isolate this, isolate this. I'm just gonna come up with one single formula that is gonna have this on the left-hand side of it. And on the right-hand side, my measurables will be on the right-hand side. These are my measurables. These are my initial conditions. All right, so the initial speed of the block is zero, so that goes away. And all of a sudden I go, wow, this is an easier problem than I thought because I was able to isolate the unknown on the left-hand side. All right, so at this point I go, okay, so obviously I got my mass values, so I'm happy. So the question is, what is the speed of the block? 
as soon as you shot a bullet into it, right? So right at the bottom of the pendulum mode, what is the speed? All right, and also you go, oh, now it gets kind of interesting. So this bullet in the block is just gonna swing in the upward direction. So at this point, I have to make the assumption, I'm just gonna ignore any sort of friction. And the friction that I'm ignoring is the air friction in this case. So if that's the case, the only force acting is the mechanical, only force acting on the system is swinging up. It's gonna be gravity. So here's the initial speed of the pendulum. Here's the final speed of the pendulum. So pendulum is gonna rise up, is it slowing down to stop and it's rising up through a distance of Y, the letter Y, that's it. So mechanical energy is conserved if that's the case. I, initial mechanical energy will be the same as the final mechanical energy. So initial and final mechanical energies will be the same. All right, so here's my initial mechanical energy. Here's my final mechanical energy. Initial mechanical energy is a combination of kinetic and potential energies. All right, and this is the initial speed in this case. And here's the final speed, which has time on it. All right, so final kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy, initial potential energy, final potential energy. Initial potential energy is zero. Final kinetic energy is gonna be zero because it's not moving. All right, so the mass is the combined mass in this case. The mass is not gonna matter. So get rid of two, get rid of the mass. So we came up with an expression for this. All right, so this is the speed of the pendulum right after you shoot a bullet into the block. All right, so this, you need to substitute back into that formula and that gives you the speed of the bullet with that. All right, so I explained, justified, explained, justified. I, I gave you all my assumptions as I was talking about. I told you why I picked the first one. I, I also told you I came up with the second one. I explained my assumptions. I said, I'm gonna ignore air friction under the circumstances. I'm just gonna assume that the, that the gravity is the only force acting on the system. Came up with a number that I cannot relate to because don't, no one really uses meters per seconds. All right, meters per seconds is something that is, you cannot relate to numbers in terms of meters per seconds. No one can, all right? The whole idea is we use metrics, units, and sciences, all right? because those are the agreed upon units, you still have to convert it to something that you can understand. All right, once again, if you're in the United States, miles per hour. If you're outside of the United States, kilometers per hour. Those are the numbers that you can relate to. So in terms of miles per hour, it's a thousand miles per hour. You see, now I can relate to it. So my next question to myself is, does this make sense? Of course it does. I both travel fast in the sun. I have an idea of how fast the sun travels, it's, 700, it's, 700, it's 773 miles per hour. So this is a thousand miles per hour. I go, okay, so it makes sense. All right, so. I solved the problem as if it's a physics problem, though I use plenty of math, I generated a number, and then I thought to myself, wait a minute, does this make sense? Yeah, because I had a reference number in mind. The reference number is, is bullets travel faster than sound. Sound is roughly about 750 to 800 miles per hour. This is more than that. I go, okay, so I'm done, I'm done. I don't have to go and look it up in the back of a book or something. I don't need to bother the professor saying, oh, okay, where are the numbers, man? Okay, I don't need to do that because I get the numbers from real life, all right? I mean, have a sense for it, guys. You don't have these references that real life problems the solutions don't come in the back of a book all right just develop a sense of what's real and what's not just have some reference numbers in the back like the speed of sound i know what it is i say okay this is this is fine all right this is a real physics problem and notice that i set it up i justified my assumptions i used plenty of math a lot of the math that we're using is just literally algebra this is algebra it's algebra this should be muscle memory right now. it's either algebra or it's trig and sometimes we use vector calculus obviously and sometimes if i have to do a derivation i'll use a little bit of integrals and derivatives, and that's the extent of it. Next level up, you will get to do this stuff using derivatives, which means that when you have to take physics at a higher level, or in your engineering classes, they will take the same concepts and they will structure it in such a way that you will stay within the mathematical methods that they are showing you. That's when you start to use more math. But the, the concepts will not be as emphasized. If you don't get the concept right now, you're, you will never get these concepts, all right? It's just, unless, for whatever reason you become curious about it. It just makes life so much more difficult if you don't understand physics of, physics of what's going on. All right, so problem number seven is another of my favorites because these are multiple step solutions. And these solutions require a really good understanding of the concepts of physics. It's an accident scene. All right, is this what happens? Sports car is the one that caused an accident. You got an SUV, evidently stopped at a red light. And this sports car just rams it from the back. Right, so uh, these vehicles lock and they skid forward. All right, the only thing you got going for you is the length of the skid marks. Right, so you show up at the scene, you measure the length of the skid marks, and then you need to figure out how fast the sports car was going. Right, I mean, obviously the guy caused the accident, was he speeding, was he moving at a normal speed, was he being careless? It helps to know what the speed of the sports car is, okay? And especially if you can figure it out, 
th that's useful information. So what was the speed of the sports car? And I like this problem because if you guys have done a simpler version of this problem, so we will be doing the same problem, except the this solution that you were using in one of the previous problems, this is just gonna go into it. All right, once again, I will just put down my facts. All right, I'm just gonna put down what's given to me, right? All right, so the mass of the sports car is known. You wanna know how fast it was known before the accident, the mass of the SUV is already given. And we know that the SUV was not moving initially. And then what happens, they, these vehicles lock, and then they will move at a common speed. And so SUV is not moving, sports car is moving, mass of the sports car, mass of the SUV. And what else is given? We are also given the, um, the coefficient of kinetic friction is also given. So which means that these vehicles are going to slide. All right, and then what I'm doing is I'm just going to visualize it just for myself in this case. So combined mass is sliding forward, so the skid marks. There's the initial speed right after impact, and there's the final speed right after impact, so it will come to stop. And I'm gonna superimpose my forces. Okay, so I identify the center mass. This is the center mass. The force is acting on the center mass, so frictional force is opposing the motion. And the weight, and you got the normal force. All right, that's it, these are my forces. All right, so the measured length of the skid marks is this. So what else, right, I'm doing my conversion. Bam. All right, and before I start the problem, all right, everything is fine at this moment. Okay, a couple of things that I need to point out. Okay, this setup. Only thing that I did that I don't like, okay, when I superimpose things like that, notice that I'm using different colors because I turned this into a force diagram. I kind of describe the motion to you. I do this sort of stuff because it's a lecture. I'm trying to describe what's going on. There's this initial speed after the collision. There's the final speed after the collision. So there are plenty of lip movements here. So which means that I'm explaining the hell out of everything. And believe it or not, I'm taking my time with it too. You're thinking this is rational, it's not. Okay, this is higher education. Uh, this is not a higher teaching institution. It's a higher learning institution. Just pay attention, okay? And eventually you'll get it. You have to practice it and then go back, listen to the lecture and go, oh, so this was a proper amount of explanation. And the explanation was delivered at the right speed, by the way. All right, this is for, this is, this is for university students. You guys are still transitioning to that level. You're thinking this is fast. You have no idea how fast things will get. Okay, this is, we are in the far, far, far right lane right now. We are on the extreme, extremely slow lane. You guys, most of you guys are fresh out of high school. You don't realize how, how slowly we are going. Compared to high school, this is fast, but I got news for you guys. Compared to university, this is nothing. Because no one is going to take their sweet time to explain this to you when it's a real lecture. You guys get up to the next level. I'm explaining it. I'm just going blah, blah, blah. All right, the only thing that I don't like the way I did this. The force diagram, when you have a force diagram, you need to also superimpose the XYZ coordinate system. If it's two dimensional, make sure that you specify which is the X coordinate system, which is the Y coordinate system. I didn't do it here, but I'm just telling you right now. On the test, if you're messing it, there's going to be a point deduction for that one. So, what do we have? Momentum is going to be conserved during impact. Boom, conservation of momentum. <clears throat> Every single impact is going to conserve momentum. All right, so initial momentum, total momentum of the system, and the total momentum of the system right after, they will be the same. So the final momentum of the system is the car SUV are moving at the same speed. The initial momentum of the system is the car is moving, SUV is not, so that goes away. And all of a sudden this turns into a simple physics problem. I'm able to isolate the speed of this sports car on the left-hand side and we are done. Of course not, this is not high school. You're not done, you're just starting out. All right, we did the warm-up exercise. We won't know the speed of the sports car unless we know the initial speed of the car vehicles right after impact. So where do you get this initial speed right after impact? This is the speed that you're looking at. Lucky for you guys, this was a test question in one of the previous tests. I usually test the certain problems I'm giving to you on purpose because we will have to build upon your knowledge of those problems. This is how it is, guys. You get tested all the time. I want to make sure that I can build upon your understanding of it or else it's going to be the same as just lecturing to this wall. And sometimes it feels like, all right, so I just wanna make sure that there's a bit of a connection so that I can build on it and I can keep physics at the level that it needs to be. That's the reason why you guys are getting weekly tests as opposed to, oh, one single midterm. And if you survive it, you're gonna have the privilege of taking the final test. And if you're lucky enough, you will get a C or better, all right? And so university students can handle that, but you guys aren't quite up to that level as yet. All right, um, so what we are looking at is boom, boom. So this combined mass is moving in this direction. And notice that now I'm just putting down my, coordinate system, I'm looking at the motion on the X direction. I want you to notice that I did not put down D or I did not put down S. Okay, so this is for 
college physics students. You guys, just some of you guys still halfway through the semester, you're using symbols which are not acceptable and you're of course failing the task, okay? Stick with the symbols. X means the motion on the X direction, Y means the motion on the Y direction, Z means the motion on the Z direction. Anything else in between needs to be justified, whatever the letters that you're using. All right, so ooh, motion on the X direction. Here's the total mass, boom, 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 it's coming to the stop. So all of a sudden I get, okay, so I'm redrawing my core, the forces, and notice that the forces are applied to the center of mass. I'm not applying these forces to the edges, but there's a good reason for it. And um, just after I talked about it, blah, 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 blah. Now I'm superimposing my coordinate system, all right? X direction, the Y direction, these forces will get analyzed relative to these. Notice that nothing, when I draw things, nothing is left fuzzy. All right, you guys draw these lines, there are no forces on it, and then there's a wiggle wiggle, I don't know what letter that's supposed to be. And then magically you have an angle which is just placed at a weird sort of way, which is not related to anything appears in the sign or the cosine, and magically you have the right answer. Guys, those magic, mag magical solutions will not be accepted from now on. Okay, because now finally, you guys are at the verge of solving real physics from halfway through the semester, but finally I think we got that. All right, so now I gotta make a decision. The decision is, uh, I wanna figure out what, how to do this force because I, I wanna figure out how to figure out the speed, the speed. All right, so initial speed at the end of the impact, <clears throat> right after impact. All right, so there are two ways of doing it. One of them is to use the kinematics equations. So you have to just kind of dig back all the way to week number two, week number three. And then you will have to make the assumption for you to be able to do that, that the acceleration is constant and you have to explain why you make that assumption on the test. Or I could say, hey, wait a minute, the motion is in the forward direction. And this motion is influenced by this force. All right, so the horizontal motion is influenced by this force. So which means that the work is being done on this system by the frictional force. And the work is a process of transferring energy in or out of the system. And the energy which is gonna be transferred into or out of the system is gonna be transferred in the form of kinetic energy. Notice that I have a line of equations and I'm able to pick and choose the portions of it based upon my understanding of physics, all right? It's not, I'm not matching symbols. I don't do that because you will see the same symbols at 10 different places on the bottom of the sheet. There's no matching symbols. It's just knowing what, understanding the concept well enough to be able to pick the right formula. So there's work being done. The energy is being transferred into the system or out of the system by a force. And there is force and there's displacement. This force is opposing this motion. So the work is being done on the system by the frictional force. And it's causing the kinetic energy of the motion to change. And then you go, ah, okay, so begrudgingly, I'm going to pick this as opposed to using kinematics equations because the reason is because this is so much faster. All right, so the conservation of energy is so much faster than kinematics equations. All right, so, so what's happening is the speed is changing. Boom, boom, boom. B prime term is the final speed of the motion of the vehicles. B is the initial speed, the final speed is going to be zero. Boom, and we're done. All right, so this is the amount of work which is going to be responsible. All right, so the work is going to be done uh, by a force. All right, so here's the force. This is a generic expression for a force. Generic expression for a force. Generic expression for a force, which means that you will have to identify what this force is. You cannot just put down always oh, the frictional force. If you're taking university physics, you will have to justify it. R is a generic direction, and this is known as a dot product, which means that if the force and the displacement, if they're not in the same direction, there's going to be an angle between them, and this is going to give you this expression with the cosine of theta is going to give you the component of this force along the direction of motion, which is responsible for this motion. All right, that's what it means. Right, there was a five minute explanation during the lecture. And it's not like I explain it once, guys. If it's important, I explain it twice. If it's important, I explain it three times. If it's important, I explain it 10 times. So if you don't get it the first time around, you go, oh, I'm listening to the videos out a little bit too fast, slow it down. If it's not, if you don't catch it the first time, you listen to it again the second time around, the third time around. It gets repeated. Every important detail gets repeated, explained using different sentences, all right? you should try to catch it at some point. If you don't get it, joking guys, if you don't get it the first time around, if it's important, I'll repeat it. If you don't get it the second time around, if it's important, I'll repeat it. All right, look for the repetition of it. If you don't get it the third time around, if it's important, I'll repeat it. And if you don't get it the, after the third time around, I got news for it. It could be genetic, it cannot be helped. If that's the case, take it up with your parents. All right, I, there's nothing, I cannot learn this stuff for it. All right, I do already 95% of the work. That's a tremendous amount of work. The only thing you have to do is just practice, make time to practice this sort of stuff. All right, so what do we do? Now, the work is a process of transferring energy, but what is work? Work is a combination of force and displacement. In this case, for the generic expression for the force, I'm looking at it, the force responsible for motion on the X direction is gonna be this, it's already pointing to the left. I could have used a more of a justification for it, but I'm just gonna pick and choose in this case. I justified it 
verbally. I say, hey, this is the force which is responsible for the work. All right. So do a back substitution. All right, so this is the speed that we're looking for. Negative, negative, so it's gonna be a positive. Um, bum, bum, bum. All right, so isolate the speed. And then you got a square here, so we'll have to do a square root. Okay, and then we'll check to see if we're done. I know we're not done because X is given to us. This is the combined mass. We're given the coefficient of friction, but we're not given the frictional force. So now we have to figure out the frictional force. All right, this is the kinetic frictional force. So this, here's the vulnerable one. N is what we need to figure out. So N is a reaction force, I'm going back to my force value. And it's a reaction force to weight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the net force on the y direction. And this thing is not accelerating on the y direction. So N is the same as WM. And W is the same as MG. All right, I didn't make the assumption that N is the same as W. I just, I, I, when you place things into a math track, let mathematics take care of that for you. Because if this surface was not was at an angle, N would not be the same as W. All right, so just trust the math that N is gonna become W at some point, but don't make that assumption. All right, and then we'll do a back substitution. Now we got our expression for the kinetic frictional force. And then we do a back substitution again. And also the masses of the vehicles do not matter. And this is it, this is the speed. Uh, they combine masses right after impact. So we'll do a back substitution into this one. All right, and that's it. It worked out. All right, so finally, the pieces are coming together. How many times did you guys see me use numbers? None. Zilch. Zero. Okay, so when do we use numbers? We use numbers because now the numbers are important because the whole purpose of the investigation is Checking to see if the sports car was going at the speed limit, the fastest the speed limit. Obviously, the guy wasn't paying attention to what was going on. Because you want to check to see if there's additional ticket that you can give this guy, right? If he's speeding, aside from being careless. So we get a number in terms of meters per second that no one understands. Once again, so if you are born and raised in the United States, miles per hour. If you're from a country outside of the United States, it's going to be kilometers per hour. And then you got some references regarding those numbers in your head. Like, you know, what's a reasonable speed going through an intersection? 30 miles per hour, 25 miles per hour, what is it? What is the speed limit at that intersection? All right, and then you will compare it to that. So you've got the number in terms of meters per second, and then you come up with 53 miles per hour. I'm thinking that the 53 miles per hour for a road which has a red light on it, unless it's an interstate or something, this may be way too fast for a guy who's not paying attention. All right, so which means that, that probably a second ticket is going to be required or something like that. And that's the thing. Now, let's move on further. Okay, so this is for college physics units. The sort of stuff that I'm going to be interested in is the train hitting a person or car hitting a person or whatever. The old boy stood in front of his friends. And for those of you guys who are taking university physics, the conceptual understanding of this is going to be a crucial. All right, so that person just got hit. The car is going at 30. The person just got hit. The amount of force acting on the person is going to be about 40,000 40, pounds. So which means that the person had to apply the same force back on the car. Okay, a couple of things. I'm coming up with these numbers. The whole idea of this is so you know where I'm getting these numbers from. Okay, so I don't usually, despite the fact that all the physics that I do, you can find it's everything that I say and do, you can find these in physics books. These are problems that I do understand problems, but despite the fact that everything has been repackaged and canonized because I'm kind of spreading my way of physics to you guys in a sense. But the physics is nothing that I came up with. I just use real life examples using standard physics solutions that you will find in every single book in essence. Okay, because I'm coming up with real life examples. It's coming out of this. I'm making a few assumptions. The assumptions that I'm making is I take the mass of this person to be my mass. It's 70 kilograms, 150 pounds. I have a rough idea of how much these vehicles weigh in terms of pounds. So it's converted to kilograms in this case. Um, and then out of that, I say the impact force again, 40,000 pounds. All right, so that's computed, obviously. So the question is how. So that's what the focus is. I, my estimate of the speed of this car is 30 miles per hour. It could be more, it could be less. I don't know, and I don't care. All right, the only thing I know is whatever the speed of this car is, the person getting hit is going to be moving double the speed of the car. All right, so the point of impact is moving roughly about 60 miles per hour. All right, so the point of impact is going to move at 60 miles per hour. This guy did not project it, get projected forward. Instead, the force was acting on his legs, center mass, did not take a force directly, so center mass is located here. 
So in the absence of a net external force acting on the center of mass, the center of mass actually retains its initial position. And the rest of the body just rotated relative to the center of mass. So the person got projected outward. So all of a sudden, if I assume speed of the car is 30, the person's speed should be about close to 60 miles per hour. <clears throat> so the question is, where am I getting that from? Okay, it comes out of the conservation of energy and momentum principle, which means that it's, it comes out of a solution requiring the assumption that the momentum is conserved and the assumption that the kinetic energy is also conserved in order to solve these problems. All right, and also I have a rough idea of what happens to the speed of the car. The speed of the car is not gonna be 30 at this point, right after impact, it's gonna be slightly less, all right? So this is an example of how you come up with real good estimates during collisions. Like, you know, what is the, how much does the speed of the person change? How much speed of the car changes and that sort of stuff. All right, so that's what we're gonna be looking at. So determine the final speed of the person is gonna be almost double the speed of the car. Determine the final speed of the car is gonna be slightly less than the initial speed of the car. Change in momentum of the person is gonna be the same as the change in momentum of the car because it's an isolated system. And so uh, that's it. Um, person is much less massive than the car. So the person is gonna be moving at a greater speed. The car is much more massive than the person. So the change in speed of the car is gonna be relatively small. So the change in speed of the person is gonna be relatively big. Change in speed of the car is gonna be relatively small. Same as Newton's third one. All right, so in order to solve this problem, we assume elastic collision. The reason why we make that assumption because here's the person, here's the car. All right, um, and then after the impact, the person is moving, so is the car. So figure out the final speed of the person and the final speed of the car relative to the initial speed of the car. So we have two unknowns. We came up with one equation, conservation of momentum equation. And it, and because we have two unknowns, we needed to come up with a second equation to solve for two unknowns. And so this became our second equation, which is the conservation of kinetic energy. And then after pages, after pages of work, we came up with two equations. All right, so the, one of the equations is that this is the speed of the car relative to its initial speed after impact. And then we came up with a second expression. This is the speed of the person relative to the speed of the car right after impact. All right, and then you will find these two equations on the formula sheet, like I said. And one of them is this equation. This is the speed of the incoming vehicle right after impact. And there is a second formula which is formula, okay, let me check see, uh, yes, which have to this. This is the speed of the target right after impact relative to the speed of the incoming object. All right. And all right, so for college physics students, I'm just probably gonna look something like this. Okay, let me just do that. All right, all right your problem is gonna look something like this. All right, we're going to do that. All right, so this is a simple example of what I would give you or something along those lines. All right, so a person giving, hit by a car, car is moving, person is not. After impact, the car is moving, the person is moving. Uh, so mass of the car, the mass of the person. Car is moving at 30, person is not. Speed of the car, speed of the person, after impact. All right, so uh, you don't have to worry about the derivations, but know which, how to use these two formulas. All right, so here's the speed of the car, right after impact. So plug the masses in and then plug the initial speed in. So it's gonna be speed in terms of miles per hour. So the car is no longer going at 30, it's going at 28. So that makes sense. Speed of the person should be roughly about double the speed of the car. All right, so what do we expect? So it's gonna be about 60 miles per hour, it's gonna be slightly less. So it's gonna be 58 miles per hour. All right, so these are estimates. Okay, so we were able to come up with these formulas, assuming that the collision was perfectly elastic. Real life collisions are not elastic. So which means that the car is gonna dent, it's gonna crumple, the person is gonna have broken bones. So kinetic energy is not gonna be conserved. So which means that some of that kinetic energy is gonna Get, it's going to get converted into deformation sound beat or whatever. So, which means that the person won't be moving at 58 miles an hour, maybe close to 25. Car is not going to be moving at 28, maybe close to 25. All right, that's it. So, these are real, real good estimates in terms of how things are done. All right, so it's an isolated system. Whether kinetic energy is controlled or not makes no difference. It's an isolated system. So, the change in momentum, the total change in momentum of the system is going to be zero. So, which means that whatever the momentum change that the car undergoes, the person's gonna experience the same change in momentum. So here's the change in momentum of the car, here's the change in momentum of the person, so it should be the same. So we know how much the speed is changed per mass, so now we can figure out the change in momentum. All right, so initial speed of the person is zero, change in momentum of the person is gonna do that, so we end up getting a number. The numbers aren't that important because we can't relate to these units, kilograms meters per second, but because we will do a number comparison, Okay, so this number is gonna be important because the change in momentum of the car is gonna be the same as the change in momentum of the person. All right, so they will experience the same change in momentum. 
All right. And out of this, I'm able to generate the impact force. I said 40 40,000 40, pounds of the impact force, all right? Because if I'm gonna talk about something, just because I don't usually get my problems from books, just wanna, I usually use real life examples, you know, to make it interesting. I'll just come up with an estimating impact time, a hundredth of a second. I'm thinking it's, it's a good enough estimating impact time because uh, they, the person doesn't have a lot of compost on, to be honest with you. So what's going to happen is bones will break at that speed. So I'll give him, I'm looking at the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is going to be hundredth of a second impact time. It's reasonable based on what, what I just saw. So I'm going to use the impossible momentum theorem. Uh, so here's the force. Here's the impact time. Impact force, impact time. This impact force is going to be responsible for the change in momentum. So the change in momentum is going to be the same for both of them. So if you divide the change in momentum by the impact time, that's going to give you the force. So change in momentum is going to be the same for the person as well as the car. All right, so this is the change in momentum of the car causing this force. And this is the change in momentum of the person due to this force. Forces are the same. Okay, once again, the numbers expressed in terms of newtons will not make any sense to anyone, but pounds we can understand. So do the convergence to pounds, and then you will come up with 40,000 pounds. So the action and reaction forces are the same responsible for the momentum change. So depending upon the estimated impact time, the force is as large as 40,000 pounds. That's it. So that's how the magic happens. Conceptually, know how to interpret this conclusion. All right, so we talked about three collisions. All right, so uh, three cases, extremely big mass, colliding with an extremely small mass. Case in point, train hitting a person, the mass of the train will be significantly larger than the mass of the person. This would, this is going to give us the speed of the train right after the impact. We don't expect that much of a change in terms of the change in speed of the train. So the train, if it's moving initially at 60, it's still going to keep on moving around 60 miles per hour. The mass of the person, 150 pounds, versus the train's mass is like 50 million pounds. Adding 50, 150 pounds to 50 million pounds and subtracting um, 150 pounds from our 50 million pounds is not going to make that much of a difference. Guys. So even with the smaller mass, so the bigger mass is going to cancel out. So the final speed of the train is almost the same as the initial speed of the train. That's it. So what happens to the person? I expect the person to move at double the speed of the train. Once again, the mass of the person is insignificantly small. No offense, guys. Your mass does not matter going up against the train. So what's going to happen is this, you can ignore it. So the mass of the train is going to cancel. So obviously, two is the only one that remains. So the person's speed is going to be almost double the speed of the train. All right, so I had a collision between the collision between two like masses so these masses are identical it's like two billiard balls one of them is moving the other is not all right so you know what's going to happen hopefully you have the life experience for that sort of stuff all right the incoming ball is going to come to a stop and the target ball is going to move at the speed of the incoming ball that's it so masses are the same so here's the final speed of the incoming so because masses are the same m minus m because we assume all of them are the same is going to be zero so the incoming ball is going to stop and now the target ball is going to move at the original speed of the initial one okay so M's are the same, so you have 2M divided by M plus M, so 2M divided by 2M is gonna be one. So speed of the target is gonna be the speed of the incoming mass. This is what happens. All right, the last one is a small mass is hitting an extremely large mass. Okay, so this is like a ball thrown up against the wall, in essence. All right, so in this case, the mass of the incoming is, incredibly small compared to the target, so you can ignore it. So the target mass is gonna cancel, or the mass of the incoming is so small, you can take that to zero. As a result, the target is not gonna move, so you could make that argument as well. So target is not gonna move, the wall is not gonna move. And so what happens is the mass of the target is gonna cancel in this case. So the final speed of the incoming is gonna be the same as the initial speed, except it's gonna be moving in the opposite direction. So between the ball is gonna bounce. Yeah. All right, guys. So that's that's pretty much it. All right. So conceptually, 